So, well, again, thanks for coming. Um, my name's Carl. I work at Tilda, and this is my esteemed colleague, Yehuda Katz. He, I don't believe he requires an introduction. So today, um, we're going to be talking about measuring your app. Um, but before we get started, I just want to start with a quick story. This was my first job you know, out of college. It was your basic e-commerce app. You know, they had uh, you know, products for sale, you added to your cart, you checked out, put in your credit card, processed an order, pretty basic. And the day in question, I was tasked with adding a pretty simple feature. Just, I think it was just something like tweak the coupon page on the checkout process. You know, pretty basic, uh, it was easy. I just did it out in a couple hours, shipped it out. Um, QA, QA accepted, you know. They had a couple people that when something was ready to go out, they just banged on the app, made sure it worked for them, very scientific. Uh, so went out into production, I went home, and everything seemed good, except I think it was about 8 p.m., my boss calls, calls me. He's like, hey, how's it going? I'm not liking the way this is starting. Never calls me. Uh, but yeah, so I was looking at some numbers, and sales seem low. Like, okay. Sales seems low, seems good. Well, I was told you made some changes to the checkout process. I, I mean, I, I think you might have broken something. It's like, oh, all right. Uh, my boss tells me that. He's also the owner of the company. It was just not too huge, so you could tell he had some stress in his voice. I mean, just know he's like every, I bet every day he's like staying at home, refreshing sales, making sure nobody broke anything. So, all right, I get out my computer. I'm going to fix this. Step one, let's see if I can reproduce it. No, nope, cannot. Go through the entire process, no problem. It's late at night, so next thing I want to do, I'll just, I'll just revert this. I don't want to deal with it. Uh, yeah, incidentally, this was a long time ago. Uh, we didn't use source control either, so that made reverting a bit trickier. It, but it was a, it was a simple change, so I just like went by memory. So I reverted that, pushed it out, and sent an email to my boss. All right, I reverted it. Let me know if everything's okay. Thirty minutes later, calls me. Yeah, sales are still down. Well, I hope I reverted it correctly, but uh, something went wrong. So next, I'm just going to go like SSH in the server. This is the obvious next step. SSH in the server and live add debug statements. <laughs> it, this was also, uh, inst this was about the same time I was actually first learning Rails. So this job was a PHP shop. So adding debug statements was much easier. It just, you just add it in the fly and it automatically reloads. Deployment, oh, anyway. so. I couldn't find anything. This took me like about five hours of debugging everything. Uh, it turns out that the actual problem was somebody else that day updated the Google Analytics tracker code, you know, that little JavaScript snippet. They updated at the same time, and given the lack of source control, I didn't know, didn't have an easy way of looking at that. But on the checkout page, the JavaScript interacted weirdly with our JavaScript on certain browsers. So that certain browser happened to be IE, which I was young. I, I didn't think to check IE. Uh, but so what lessons can we learn from this, really, besides use source control? But everybody here has already learned that, I assume. But the main lesson I want to focus on is uh, my boss had a hypothesis, right? He, his hypothesis was where sales are down. And I, nobody really had any real way to validate that hypothesis quickly. You know, like, he looked at some sales reports, just hit refresh a whole bunch, but besides that, there wasn't anything. Um, then I had the hypothesis that my coupon code, like, my coupon tweak was the culprit, but I had an absolute no way of validating that short of insane amounts of debugging. If I had, like, been, if I had been collecting just a little bit of data, I think it would have been much easier to debug this issue. And that's really going to be the thesis of this talk. You know, I'm going to try to convince you by the end that just like I don't think, I hope nobody here would not write tests for their app, I think I'm going to try to convince you that you need to measure anything that matters in your app, basically. Anything that provides value so, so that you can quickly detect things that break. So before we continue, quick little game. Which line is low? So, on the next slide, I'm going to show you a very basic Rails action, only two lines of code, and I'm going to tell you this action responds in about one second. And it's going to be up to you to try to determine which line that is. 
So here are the two lines. Give you a minute. So uh, who thinks line one? Oh, one person. It's bright two. Boom. What about the second one? Line two. Oh, every, everybody seems like vast majority line two. What, what, what does Senor Katz think? I don't have the microphone. Oh, sorry. Oh, the the, just the second line of this action. So the team like users equal users.where, admin false. Second one's render JSON, users first. All right, yeah. so I'm just going like, to let you know, I don't know, this is a Rails 3 app. So what actually is going to happen here in theory is that users where is going to create a scope. And so that's going to just create like a, a lazy object. And then when you call first on that lazy object, it's, it's going to rewrite the SQL query to be efficient. So in theory, if you just look at this, it should just pull one user from the database and render it. OK, but let me show you a little bit more. So I'm telling you now that this code is in the model. Huh? That should be self.where, bro. Oh, well, I didn't actually run this. But that should be self.where. So it's overriding that, uh, that function. So assuming this, now which line do you think is the culprit? Line one? Anybody? Line two, uh, getting smart. So this is what I'm actually going to tell. Now I'm going to give you some measurements. Like the first line takes 0.1% of the request, and the second line takes 0.4. So now we have some data. We can determine that actually it's not in here. Let's continue looking further. OK. We find a <laughs> before filter with this little bit. You, I'm sure many people have seen code like this before. So the main point is, and the main point is like, this is like a kind of a tongue-in-cheek example, but uh, I'm sure nobody here really knows every line of code that you're running your Rails app. Like, oh, even if you're the only developer on that app, you still have all the gems, probably hundreds of gems you pull in your app, and you don't know every line of code. So you need a way to determine when things go wrong, how you need a way to quickly determine what's happening. So how do we do that? So, Actually, I was at CodeConf a few years ago, and I saw a talk by this gentleman, Coda Hale, and it really resonated with me. Basically, the way he put it was, as developers, we uh, aren't paid to code. We're paid to provide business value. We're paid like, to write code, but that code is supposed to add a feature or make the site faster or do something that ends up providing value to the business. So. And that, and that code provides that value in production. So it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter at all whether or not the, like, it runs fast on your dev box. It doesn't matter if CI is green. What matters is what's actually happening in production. So how do we know um, that this is happening? Basically, what we need to have is a correct mental model of how our run, code runs in production. And we do that by measuring. So what do we measure? Well, the easy version is we measure business value. Uh, we're going to, we need to measure our application responding to users completing tasks that in the end, those tasks make us money. So going back to my original story, uh, what's the obvious thing I could have measured, right? So well, the obvious thing to measure is going to be, let's measure how much money we're making. So this is, I think, probably the key metric for most businesses, if you're not a Silicon Valley VC backed one. <laughs> but uh, if I had something as basic as m maybe a line graph with dollars made per minute, I would have been able to see the dollars dropped off. Like, oh, I shipped this, and now this is going way down. Um, oh, <laughs> or Bitcoin, if that's what you're into. So, and we can do more than that. We can take that data and we can save it off. We can like, we can use it to as reference to like kind of see tell like notice trends. We can use it to uh, create a benchmark for every point in the day, how much money do we think we should be making. And we can build uh, tools that use that benchmark and take the current value of that. And if it falls below a certain threshold for a certain amount of time, let's send out an alert. Let's like have a tool tell us five minutes after we, sh we deployed that something's broken instead of our boss calling us like five hours later. Right? That, in the end, if our boss doesn't call us, everybody's happier. But 
So that would have just told me, right, just told me like something was wrong. We need to go beyond that. Like what I need to be able to create like a hypothesis, like, okay, now I already know something's broken. We're not making money. So what is broken? I need to be able to make a decision quicker about where to fix it because things are busted. So what we need to do is like all applications like have many steps in the process of making money. We really should be instrumenting every single step along the way. Like for example, I don't know, in my example, like number of users that add items to the shopping cart. That's the first step. Let's track that. How many items get added? Let's track that. Right? How many items get removed? That's also important. And then from that, how many, well, what's the number of users that check out? And then from that, what's the number of users that like, uh, have successful orders? So w what I'm saying also is yes, you probably are using some sort of like tools to measure this on the business side, but I'm really saying on the developer side, we also need something that measure it for us. Because then when you ship something into production and it breaks everything, right? you can then look at this data and find pinpoint like which part, which part of the process is broken. So if it's important for your business, measure it. Because if it's not measured, how do you know it's working? And performance is also business value, right? I'm sure you might have already heard this, but I'm just going to repeat it like the research that both Google and Amazon have done, right? Like Google, I think they said like, oh, every time their search result page went from 0.4 seconds response time to 0.9, response, 0.9 seconds response time, they lost 20% in ad sales. And Amazon, every extra 100 milliseconds of response time, like caused them a loss of 1% in sales. So performance is really critical as well on the business side. And well, I guess the good news is we already have tools that uh, measure the average response time for us, but... Hey, hold on. Other mic should have been hey, yeah, the other mic should have been there. Seems good. So uh, Carl just said, we have tools that measure average response time. So uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to go off into academic land briefly. Uh, and the reason for that is that I think a lot of us do hear the term average response time, and they think that what they're getting is a useful piece of information that they can use to... Uh, understand what their app is doing. So Carl talked about having a sane mental model for what your application is doing. And where a lot of people start is they start with having an average. And what I'm here to tell you is that that actually gives you a very poor, misleading, and broken mental model of what's going on. So I want to start, just to make sure we're all on the same page, I want to start and go back to Statistics 101 or high school statistics. Uh, I'll start with, I'll start with uh, simple. So we have a big list of numbers here, a small list of numbers, and if we want to find the average, just want to make sure everyone knows what an average is. Uh, if you want to get an arithmetic average, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add up all the numbers in the list. We're going to get a sum, and then we're going to divide by the count. We're going to get a number out, and we're going to have an average. So that's, uh, that's step one. How do you get an average? You add up the numbers. This is actually a re relatively easy thing to collect because you can basically just keep a running total and a running count. And as you get more data points, it's pretty easy to add another thing to your total and divide by a, the next bigger number and you get the new average. So quite easy to collect. And, but soon I will show that it's not quite easy to be useful. Uh, median is actually quite, uh, quite a bit more useful. And basically the idea behind median is that you take uh, the numbers, you line them up in order, you get the middle numbers. Uh, if there's two in the middle, you average them, but you, get, you basically get out a number. In this particular example, the median and mean are roughly the same. So the average that we got by doing the easy to collect information gave us something like 17.35. The median, which we got by doing a more, a comp more complicated thing, which is ordering every, lining up everything in order and getting the middle, gave us a similar thing. Um, now, it's a little bit deceptive, because I think when you learn mean and median in high school, you have like a small set of numbers, so it's, it feels like you're, it's a quite similar thing. Unfortunately, it's not very easy to keep a running total of median because you need either all the numbers so you can keep putting them in order and getting the middle one, or you need some sort of uh, algorithm or data structure that's doing it, and it, uh, it's not super easy. Um, and then the no another thing, and I don't want to go through what, how you collect a standard deviation. Uh, I'm just going to say that the standard deviation of this list is 4.96. Most people think of a standard deviation as like a variance. It's, it's uh, how, how 
dispersed are all the numbers in this group. So 4.96 basically means that as you move 4.96 in either direction, you are going to get less and less likely to hit a particular number. So what, the way most people think when they hear I have a standard deviation of something, they think in their head of this bell curve. So again, in high school, you probably learned about the bell curve. So your mental model of a lot of this stuff is really, I think, deeply rooted if you know statistics at all in the bell curve. So let me do another exercise here. Let's say we have someone tells you, I have gone into my application uh, performance portal, and it has told me that my mean is 50, and my standard deviation is 10. Uh, most of these things don't give you a standard deviation, but let's just assume that somehow you have it. Most people's mental model is going to be, OK, jump directly to that normal curve. That means that about 68% of all my requests are going to be between 20, 40 and 60 milliseconds and something like 95% of all my requests are going to be between 20 and 80 milliseconds. And very importantly, your mental model says something like, as I keep going further and further out, the likelihood of hitting something 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds becomes extremely rare. It should basically never happen. If, you, your, if your mental model, model is like this, 500 millisecond responses should basically never, ever happen because they're so far off from the center when, even when you take standard deviation into consideration. Unfortunately, the real world does not actually look like the platonic normal distribution. What the real world looks like, uh, and this is also uh, somewhat platonic in the sense that the real world is even more complicated than this, but the real world looks a lot like this, which is that there's a bunch of stuff that uh, you start off pretty high, you get like what kind of looks like a skewed uh, normal distribution, and then you get a pretty long tail. And I what I want to do is to show a couple of illustrations of what these distributions look like when we're talking about real world things that have nothing to do with programming. Uh, so if the average male height is 60 inches and the standard deviation is 3 inches, this distribution behaves like you would expect. 68% of all men are between 5'7 and 6'1, et cetera, et cetera. And by the time you even get to 4'10 to 6'10, you're getting to a much, very tiny percentage of people that are outside of it. And therefore, the correct thing for your gut to say is if you are very unlikely to ever encounter a man who is 10 feet tall. That is basically astronomically unlikely. You will, ne will never happen. It is also very unlikely to uh, encounter a man who is one foot tall, uh, although more likely, um, perhaps. So uh, the point is that we have these distributions, and a lot of our gut feeling, a lot of what we learn in school, um, even in college about statistics, is based around this kind of distribution. We have, something, we have a, uh, some bunch of stuff grouped in the middle, and as we move out from the middle, we get to be much, much less likely, and therefore, in our brains, we automatically say, we don't actually care about things that are far out. We don't care about things that are hundreds of milliseconds out. Our intuition is basically that outliers are, extreme, are quickly become extremely rare. So when you hear someone talk about an outlier, so if I was to tell you that your mean response time is 100 milliseconds and you have a standard deviation of 50, your gut would tell you that 500 milliseconds based on that information is definitely an outlier. You should not care about it. It doesn't matter. But that doesn't actually turn out to be how the distribution works in reality. Again, I think what this, tell, what this makes you feel like is we only have to worry about values that are clustered around the middle. We only, and some approximation of that is we only have to worry about values that are clustered around the mean. So we rely a lot on tools that give us mean averages, and we start to think, we start to feel comfortable with this gut intuition that it's OK, we only have to worry about values clustered around the middle. Like I said, unfortunately, the world largely is not distributed normally at all. So for the most part, the thing that I just told you about what our intuition says is completely wrong. Um, so here's an example, something like average salary. If I tell you the, this is, these are roughly correct. The average salary in the United States is about 60,000. Standard deviation is 30,000. And what you'll notice is you would expect that if I got to 90,000, 120,000, 150,000, you would expect to basically never, in the same way that you would expect to never encounter somebody 10 feet tall, you'd expect to never, ever encounter in your entire lifetime somebody making a million dollars. But it doesn't work out like that. What happens in practice is that there are vast, there, there are uh, distributions like the one that we see here for income distribution that really don't look anything like what your gut, what your intuition tells you. So if someone tells you the average salary in the United States is 60000 I think a lot of people think, ah, that pretty much means that it's clustered around the middle. But of course, that's not true at all. Of course, as you, you can see that as I'm having, I'm going from 50 to 25 to 12 to 6, you can see that the amount that we're increasing by has stayed roughly the same as we go in half. And basically what that ends up meaning is that long tail distributions are not clustered around the middle. So the, in, the uh, 
people making a million dollars are what you would think of as massive outliers, but they're actually not, because the distribution doesn't look like what you were taught in school is the distribution. If we focus on the middle, on the mean, we're actually going to lose a large chunk of reality. So we're going to feel like 500 milliseconds is extremely unlikely, basically astronomically unlikely, when in fact it's just a little bit unlikely, somewhat unlikely. And pro tip, it turns out web responses are the same, similar type of distribution as income. You would think that if you got 100 milliseconds as your average, that 500 milliseconds would be extremely unrare, extremely uncommon, extremely rare. But in fact, that does not turn out to be true in practice. Now, uh, not every single distribution of every single response is exactly what is called a log normal distribution. But they are more log normal than they are normal. And, this, and what that means is that they are more long tail. There's more data keeping on going out, 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 out than there are, uh, than you rapidly go down into the abyss. So let me try to uh, say it another way. So you see average response time is 150 milliseconds. Standard deviation is 50 milliseconds. You think 95th percentile is between, or 95 percent of all of my requests are between 50 and 250 milliseconds. And if I was to see a 500, a 500 millisecond request, it would be extremely rare. I could basically ignore it. It basically means something crazy happened. The reality is nothing like that at all. The reality is that you have a long tail which means that in this particular case, 500 millisecond responses might be relatively common. Now, that doesn't mean that half of all your responses are going to be 500 milliseconds, but it means that it would not be surprising at all to get to a uh, 5 or 10% of all your requests are in a very, uh, what looks to be a very outlierish position. So that's, that's sort of the, the crux of what I'm getting at here. Um, and what I want to say is, if, what you, if, the, if your mental model is the normal distribution, things are clustered around the middle, if I know my mean, it's fine, I'll just drag my mean to the left and everything's great, well, you end up with a situation where you don't have really good intuitions around consistent performance. You end up with intuitions that are making you feel like you're making things better, but in fact, there's a whole bunch of requests that are hundreds and hundreds of milliseconds to the right of your mean, and you're, just, you're not doing anything with them. So I think the way I usually have started to look at this since I've been looking, uh, looking at a lot of real data more, is there is basically in many, many web requests, there's basically three areas. There's uh, something like 60% of your requests are in, on the left, and those requests usually are within some kind of tolerance that you're willing to do, like 150 milliseconds, and you could basically, uh, you're happy with them, you don't have to worry about optimizing those at all. Uh, maybe you, you might be interested in optimizing them for some reason, but you have bigger fish to fry usually than the stuff that's to the, to the left of that. And then you have like another 20% are uh, not, not super great, but they sort of obey your intuition about the distribution, right? It's like 20% and now you're at 250 milliseconds. Seems fine if you, you, your intuition is if you move the mean over, it's going to get those. But then the problem is there's like another 15% of requests. And again, that's <laughs> something like one out of every eight requests that your, that your users make. And um, keep in mind, many users make more than one request. So if you're seeing one in eight requests is extremely slow, it's going to, one user is going to hit those on, from time to time, the really slow request. Uh, you basically are getting to, you get to a point where you have um, this very unintuitive uh, group of requests that are hundreds and hundreds of milliseconds to the right of your mean and that make up something like approaching to like 95, 96, 97, 99 percent of all your requests. So basically the way I imagine that you should deal with this is you should pick a tolerance, like I am happy with 150 milliseconds, and then you should optimize to the right. So you should basically go and say, let me go deal with the requests that are to the right of my tolerance. Now, of course, in order to do that, you're going to need the ability to know what exactly is going on, not to the left of the, of the 150 milliseconds, but to the right of the 150 milliseconds. And probably, you're going to want to differentiate between the ones that are somewhat intuitive and the ones that are basically long tail crazy. I don't really know what's going on here. Um, now, a lot of people, because their gut intuition is very normal curvy, when you start talking about things this way, they really want to think that 95th percentile is some crazy outlierish number. Because of the way that you've been taught to think about distributions, 95th percentile really feels like if I don't have to worry about that. Anything outside of 95th percentile is like super rare. But actually, what that means in the real world is that 5% of all your requests, one out, of, one out of every 20 requests, is slower than this number. So in this case, let's say we say the 95th percentile is 500 milliseconds. That's much worse than the mean. The mean here would tell you like 150 or something. 
but um, it's, very far, it's very far to the right, but it still means that one out of every 20 times your user makes a request, they're gonna get something that's slower than 500 milliseconds. And of course, one out of every 10 users is gonna get something slower than like 400, right? So you really need to be thinking about it in terms of what is actually going on in these particular regions. And what that is, in our case, is a product that we've been working on called Skylight. Um, Skylight is basically a, uh, right now it's very early, we, I would say it's MVP uh, quality. Um, but what we have done is basically build an entire performance monitoring solution around the idea of histograms, around the idea of actually get looking at, being able to look at the distribution that is real and basically giving you the insight into what's going on in these particular locations. So let me actually switch off and show you that. So this is why this is a product and services track. Uh, so how does one do this? Yeah, awkward, sorry, guys. Okay, I'm gonna mirror displays. Come on. All right, there we go. Okay, so the first thing that I'm gonna show you here is, here is an example from a real application, uh, our first customer actually. Uh, they're using Skylight, you can see that there's a bunch of requests, 279, and the first thing that I would like to call out is that the distribution, in fact, looks quite like the log normal distribution, the weird skewed distribution that I showed before. It actually looks nothing like the normal distribution. And in fact, if you start using uh, a tool like this that lets you see the real distribution, you, you know, that's a very early thing you notice, is like the normal distribution is, never happens. Basically, for, for reasons that are not fully understood, you never hit that scenario. Now, like I said before, you actually want to differentiate between the faster requests um, and the slower requests. So you can see here that when I click faster, it's selecting like the top third, uh, the fastest third request. When I click slower, it's selecting the bottom third. And down here, we're basically using um, active support notifications and so a few other things to collect information about what's going on in your request. Uh, it's important to note here, um, so if you're familiar with like the Chrome debugging tools, it's quite similar to those, except that this is showing the information about a whole bunch of requests mixed together, not one particular request. So you can see, for example, that uh, the faster requests have very little time spent in GC, uh, while the slower requests have a lot of time spent in GC. Um, and in our particular case, what we've done is, uh, GC is something that can get very noisy, so if you're looking at how much time is spent in, for example, a SQL query, uh, if you just ignore GC entirely, often the, uh, Ruby will start running GC in the middle of a SQL query, and you'll start, you'll see like, oh my god, my SQL query is taking like, 500 milliseconds, what's, well, I mean, Ruby's GC is not that slow, but my SQL query is taking like 100 milliseconds, in, well, that makes no sense at all, so one of the first things that we did was basically subtract out the um, GC time from all these little circles so that you can um, get a real sense of it and not get to all this noise um, around what's going on. So, um, now of course, like I said before, you don't necessarily only want to look at faster or slower, you also want the ability to look at particular distributions, so um, you can select any distribution that you want, and you can see that the bottom area is live updating, which is pretty awesome. Um, and one thing that we have not done yet, but which we are planning to do in the near future, uh, is basically for, every, for any area that you happen to have selected, so you select this area over here, right now you can see basically what's going on. Uh, we plan to have key requests down here that are basically some particular requests that represent that area that you selected that will give you much more information, like uh, you know what exact SQL queries are being called. So um, I think it's not, one other option if you wanna get detailed information is just to get the very slowest request. But obviously the very slowest request really is an outlier. Um, but here you can basically say, I want a request from this range or I want a request from this range. Um, you get the full details, so that's great. Um, and then I just want to show another example. So this is, uh, this is a, a different distribution. And what you see here is um, after this morning's keynote, I'm sure everyone's going to run home and cash, 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 uh, all the nesting dolls. And, and what you can see here is that um, often if you're caching a lot, obviously the cache hits are going to be uh, are going to be represented by information over here, and then you have all the way down here the cache misses, right, that are much, much slower. And of course, averages completely hide this type of thing, right? The average is somewhere in the middle, but that's, there's no real request in this case, even in, in what the average would tell you. So you would have completely lost it, where if you go just click on, uh, click on this example here, you can see right away that there's two, essentially two different requests going on here. There's the cache request and the, the non-cache requests. Um, the last thing that I want to say uh, here in the demo is, actually I'll show the real one, B2. 
be better. Um, is so right now uh, we're planning on on adding uh, things like notifications um, to the right side here. But for right now, what we have basically here is a list of endpoints, and there's a couple things that I would I would want to call out here. The first one is that the order is basically based on importance, and that's a combination of how many uh, requests per minute you're getting and how slow it is. So if um, your response times are very slow, but basically nobody hits it, then maybe it doesn't really matter unless it's really really slow. Maybe then it does matter. Um, and the response time here is actually not the average response time, it's the 95th percentile. Uh, and the 95th percentile, again, you might think is this like crazy super outlierish thing, except remember that web responses are not clustered around, uh, around the middle. So the 95th percentile in this case, uh, so here we have 279, so like half, 5% uh, is uh, like 12 or 13 responses. So we can see that the 95th percentile goes out. Um, 95th percentile is everything. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of stuff, but um, there's still like 20 or 30 requests. Actually, that's it's more like here, right? There's still like 20 or 30 requests that are outside the range. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get it for reals. Uh, so let's say something like this, right? There's still a bunch of requests that are outside, which you would not expect if your mental model was the simple mean, and then when you get out of there, it's like crazy. Um, so still one out of every 20 requests here is going to be uh, more, worse than 600 or 700 milliseconds, whatever we had there. And I think one thing that's important to note is I think one of the first things that happens, we have a few people using, uh, using Skylight now, one of the first things that happens is that that number is really a shocker, right? So they're used to seeing like 150 over there or 100 because that's what other uh, tools give you when they talk about averages. And we're giving you a number that looks much worse um, but what we're giving you is a number that is much more honest and uh, admittedly harder to collect, but um, much more honest. So that's the deal. Uh, I don't know if this is on. Is that on? All right. So that, uh, th uh, thank you. I, I don't think we're quite done. I've shown you the demo. Oh. I've talked about statistics, yeah. and I think me and Carl are going to close off. So let me just um, let me switch back to non-mirrored. and. I think, yeah, for us, the main uh -huh. thing is that we want to get this out as soon as possible because we want people on it so that we can so be solving real world problems. Uh, just having a few people on it helped us tremendously. So, and I, yeah, what, like you mentioned, I think the, the most interesting thing we found was first responses, not sticker shock, but I had no idea what was going on because they had what is considered a pretty performant Rails app, but they discovered many things. Yeah, and I, I think one thing I found that was interesting when I was uh, starting to look into this is um, in 2009, DHH wrote a blog post called The Problem with Averages, and essentially in this blog post he wrote, um, at the end he said, well, we need our histograms. I want, basically, you need to actually physically look at it because, honestly, your intuition is just wrong, right? You look at a percentile, even if you look at standard de deviation, your intuition about what's going on is just wrong. You need to see what's really happening, the real distribution. Um, I also, uh, in, res in the comment, in response to DHH's post, uh, the principal architect from New Relic said, I also agree that a histogram is the ultimate answer to understanding the user experience. And I think basically our position is averages are, uh, I think I should be saying averages are great. Averages are not great. Averages are basically information that are telling you something that is inaccurate, that's misleading, that plays to the wrong part of your intuition, the wrong part of your schooling, and you basically are going to get, you're going to be making assumptions about, like what Carl said before, about measurement around what you know that are just completely incorrect, that don't reflect how web responses actually work in the real world. Um, so you can sign up. Yeah, Brock? Yeah. So it's still private right it's now, but we'll be, at the, we'll be at the booth adding anybody who wants access, get fee like try it out, give us feedback, because we want to build this tool to solve like real world problems, your problems. Yeah. So just a couple more slides. So um, there's a lot. So obviously this was like what we were able to finish in time for this talk. So um, what you've seen is super early. Um, there's a lot coming soon. There's like uh, one thing I want to say is like getting real data really changed the way I thought about the app. Like my initial gut feeling about what we would actually build and what would be important turned out to be a little bit different. Like once you put real users on, the questions that they were answering were asking were quite different than the questions that I expected them to, a to ask. And that's because once you can get a sense of like, okay, like 30% of my requests are in this range, and I can see that you know a certain amount of time is being spent in SQL or a certain amount of time is being spent in Ruby, you start you start really asking questions that are hard to ask in the first place when you when you're looking at averages. So you you get averages 150 milliseconds is really not much to do, but if you see 30% of my requests are in a range where the Ruby is super slow, you start asking, like, why is the Ruby super slow? Is it, like, related to how many, how big of a payload I'm processing here? Or maybe it's, like, 
my server is occasionally slow and like not giving me enough CPU, right? Like ask, ask, actually being able to ask these questions is really powerful and I think what we're probably gonna be working on next is just making it easier to ask these questions now, or to answer these questions now that it's much easier to ask them in the first place. Um, and I think in general, like this type of structure of, of operating around histograms, seeing aggregate distributions really gives you a better feel for what you don't know, right? So I think when you see a mean, there's so, basically the amount of things that you don't know is so vast that you don't even really have a good way to think about like what you might wanna know. But when you, when you open the door to seeing basically what's going on for real, you start having a good question about what's up. Um, I wanna close with just uh, us, I'm really, excited that uh, it's now like two, a year and a half or something since we started Tilda. Uh, we've been doing a lot of consulting. We've been doing bootstrapping. Um, I pretty much worked at VC funded companies a lot before Tilda and I'm uh, definitely bel big believer in bootstrapping now, big believer in healthy sustainable businesses that are um, people working with other community members that they have a kinship to, uh, not necessarily you know big sales run businesses. I've been there before uh, and I'm pretty much over that. So. We definitely want to, we, we're basically developers. We have, you know, we do consulting and we build real products that show us basically what is wrong and I think we want to help ourselves and you get to a better place, understanding what's happening in your applications, performance, et cetera. So thank you very much you. and definitely come to our booth tomorrow and get signed up. Thanks. Oh. Ah, seems good.